Anyone here from Israel? Out of interest? You are me? Anyone else? Okay. Europe? Who's here? Who's, who's from Europe? Me included. Portugal, that's lovely. Alex, you said that you were in Abathalona, yes. UK. Hello, Julian, yes. Always nice to meet a fellow Brit. Thank you. Okay, shall I shall I start? Yeah, I'd like to give a quick intro for other people here, and uh, then you can start your presentation. So, uh, for other people um, that are maybe new here, um, this is a workshop in collaboration with Matchbox DAO and uh, Jamie Gave. And uh, Matchbox DAO is an ecosystem collective uh, of um, developers, designers, writers, educators, uh, where we try to bring on-chain gaming to the next level on Starknet, which means we are building the infrastructure, um, we educate people with these workshops, um, we are building games, we mentor devs um, and sponsor games. And uh, today we have a very nice workshop with uh, Jamie Gabe, who is going to introduce us uh, his Cairo test suite. And uh, without further ado, uh, Jamie, you can begin. Mr. Prime, thank you very much. And Yoni, well, thank you, Yoni and Mr. Prime for the invitation to speak. Um, this is going to be an informal, accessible, simple presentation. I'm not going to do anything fancy and you are very welcome to ask questions. Um, just to get us started off, could you please put a hi into the chat box, um, <clears throat> just so you, you practice expressing yourself. Please express yourself. Excellent. Oh, all this self-expression, it, it, makes, it makes my heart, it makes my heart throb. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I will serve you Markdown Raw, that is unrendered. Um, I hope that's all right. It just, it makes things easier for me and I actually find it easier to read. Um, so testing, golly, testing, yeah. Who needs testing? Um, please say yes if you think testing is important and no if you think you're just too cool for testing. All your code is perfect. A few more responses, please. Come on, enter into the spirit. Excellent, okay. Uh, <coughs> no one's trolled me by saying no, so thank you, I guess, for that. Um, who has heard, forgive me for asking, who has heard of property-based testing? Please put in a yes or a no. Miguel has heard and used. So it's looking like roughly half-half. So to those of you who are familiar with property-based testing, um, please forgive me if I everything I now say is obvious. And to those of you who have never heard of property-based testing, I declare property-based testing. Um, you're in for a real treat. So let's 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 do a bit of demoing. So what is a property-based test, and how do they differ from unit tests? I'm, I'm going to assume you've all heard of unit tests. Please, please put a no. In the, in the chat if you haven't heard of unit-based tests. Phew, okay, good. Um, so let's get it, jump into Python. Hurrah, we're in Python and let us write a highly complex computation. There we are, my numerical identity. Let's try it. I'm going to check whether zero is zero. True. Excellent. This looks like an excellent program. Um, please type yes if you're with me so far and type no if you have any questions. Go on, let's get some chat going here. Cool. Looking good. Um, it sounds like somebody is unmuted. I can hear like wind in the background. So could you please just check, check you're muted and mute yourself. Yoni, I'm afraid you may be the guilty party. You might like, yeah, it was Yoni. It was Yoni. Well, I'm not picking you out, Yoni, but it is. Sorry, it... sorry, sorry. And then he made it worse. Okay, thank you. So here we have this, this program. Um, and we believe in testing. So 
let's write some unit tests, okay? Hurrah, we have unit tests. And now, I mean, what, um, <coughs> um, so far so obvious, but let's just look at this. Uh, please type yes if you could imagine yourself writing such unit tests for your identity function, and no if you think I've missed something. Please go ahead in the in the chat. Remember, I can't see faces, so my only feedback is what you choose to put in the chat. Alex has said no numeric. Alex, can you unmute yourself and, and s explain what, what you mean by that? Maybe we can try to add a string there or something that's not numeric to see what happens. You're, you're right, actually. Thank you. Uh, I, you're absolutely right. I'm not going to do that because it anticipates the point I'm going to make next. But let's just imagine implicitly that this is numerical. I called it numeric. It's intended to be run on integers. So if someone passes a string, that's a type error already. Does that make sense, Alex? Cool. The usual is null not equal to zero. Yeah, yeah, okay, Miguel, thank you. They're way too sophisticated. We're just integers. Just integers. It's it's cool. So <clears throat> um, let's run my unit tests. And as you can see, all the asserts have succeeded. So we might be tempted to think that our code is correct. Um, and it's not. But um, we have to know what to look for. So I'm just going to run this and we get false. Who can explain to me what just happened? What have I done? Please um, unmute your microphone and tell me. Please feel free. Anyone out there? I, I can just guess, but I think like the numbers are too big, so there are two different objects in different uh, locations in memory, and that's uh, why you're using is, uh, and they are not is, right? Like they point to different yeah. objects. Milan, you're absolutely right. Thank you, thank you. So um, the um, what Milan and Miguel have pointed out, this is quite an interesting little thing about Python. Python inlines small numbers, but when the numbers get too big. It, it stores them, and they have to be quite big, like two to the power of 100. Oh, did I say time? Sorry, let's try this. Apologies. There. So at some point, maybe around the 8-bit or the 64-bit mark, um, we will observe a change from inlining to not inline. 63 is OK. 64 is OK. I'll try 128 and then give up. False, there we are, maybe 127 will work. No. So if I put in a bit of effort, I could find find the boundary. Uh, please give me a yes in the chat if that makes sense, and a no if it doesn't. Okay, everyone's, everyone's saying yes. So, I mean, basically, there's, there's two errors, there's two mistakes here. One is that I used is here, and I shouldn't have. Um, but, you know, maybe the person who wrote this program had a good reason for writing is, and I as a user have not understood what this was really intended to do. And maybe they tested their function on a few unit tests. I mean, this looks very reasonable, but it's wrong. This is, this is, this code is incorrect. Okay. Um, so, unit tests are all very well, but We've noted one potential problem with them. They struggle to be, they struggle for coverage because creating unit tests is linear in programmer time. Please say yes if that makes sense and no if it doesn't, please. Okay. Um, by the sound of it, my pacing and my timing are okay, so I will continue. I am now going to import um, hypothesis which is a Python property-based test suite. There we are. Now, now we have hypothesis. And I am going to create an arbitrary integer. This is one of my favorite things. There we are. A is now an integer. 
So in order to actually get a concrete instance of A, I have to type A example. Aha! Hypothesis has given me 7,715. Do that again, minus 39, and so on. So what we see here, or you can think of this as a generator, right? A is an object that on demand will generate arbitrary random, if you like, random integers. Um, just reassure me, please say yes if, if you're with me so far, and no if you have any questions at all. I'm here for you. Great. Okay, thank you. And I'm also going to create just the number five, just for completeness. So B is also a generator, but if I ask for an example of B, it will give me five. <laughs> so there you are, just so you know. Um, okay, and now we can, I mean, you can see what's coming here, but I'll just, I'll just run it. So this creates 10 examples of A. There you are. This is nice, isn't it? I think this is nice. Um, so this is an easy way to generate arbitrary inputs for your tests. But what kind of tests? We will come to that. And I'm just going to point out a small gotcha here. Um, it matters. Um, evaluation of this is eager. That is, here we pick an example and then multiply it by 10. So um, this is not going to give us desired behavior. But that's fine. OK. Um, again, just give me a quick yes in the chat if you're fine so far, and know if you have any questions. Great. Thank you. Okay. Now, I will now run this code. Before I run it, I just want to show you, I just want to read through it. This is a function that tests my numerical identity by inputting an A and a B, and um, checking that my numerical identity returns what I think it should. Okay? Just give me a quick yes in the chat if you're with me so far, and then know if you have any questions at all. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is all, it's meant to be obvious, right? If something's not obvious, then my programming isn't good enough here. Um, <clears throat> some of you may have noticed that I used an equal true here, and maybe you wondered why I did that. Why didn't I just assert my numerical identity or not my numerical identity? So I did this to mirror the format of this. I didn't have to, but I mean, that's where, that's where that equality came from. Now, these are decorators which will run the test function on these example inputs and the attentive reader will note that this reproduces these unit tests. Okay, please give me a yes in the chat if this is all completely obvious. Cool, thank you. And then another thing here. This is a decorator which will run the test on, I think, 200 randomly chosen inputs and then shrink. I'll come to what that means in a second. OK, so what we're doing is we're running our unit tests and these are maybe boundary conditions which the programmer has good cause to be careful of. And then we try a scattergun approach. We just run it on 200 other integers, any integers, and just see what happens. Let's do it. And now I can run my test, drum roll, say yes if you think this will run without incident, and no if you think it might crash. Please. Yeah. We know it's not going to run, right? Because Oh, Milan thinks it will. I, I don't think it will because we've already established that 2 to the power of 128 will break this test. Mm? But let's see what counterexample it comes up with. We have a failure. Okay, it's falsifying example there. But this fails even on minus 6. Hmm? 
I want to point out something interesting here. Well, actually, no, I'll just run this. Let's try it. Let's try it by hand. Are you ready? Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't mean test. I mean my numerical identity. Now, this returns true, which is nuts, because I can run the test again, and it will give me minus six. <laughs> so how can this how can this become true? Huh? And the answer is, it's just a subtlety. If I set A to be equal to minus six and B to be equal to minus six, and then I call my numerical identity on A and B, then I'll get false. Not say. Uh, give me a yes if you're with me so far, and a no if you have any questions. Any no's, any questions? Okay. Now watch this. This is really, this is really weird. If I run it with a and b equal to minus 5, it works. So there's, there's something about comparing references smaller than minus 5. David, it's Python. It just, it does its own thing. And that's what I love about Python. David had a question. He asks, uh, why does it do that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime. My answer is, it's Python. Python does its own thing. David, can you unmute your microphone and just clarify what you mean by that? Because we've seen at least three crazy things already. Yeah. Why, why does it give you true when you assign the, um, the integers to A and B, but when yeah. you put it in the function, it gives you false? So this returns true if I feed the integers in directly, but if I if I do it with a little bit of indirection, it returns false. So I don't know the answer, but I can make an educated guess that Python has some optimizations going on. It reads this, recognizes that minus six is the same as minus six, and just creates one instance of minus six and passes two pointers to my numerical identity. Whereas here, I've deliberately created two instances of minus six and passed them. Does that make sense, David? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you. But um, it, it only makes a very small amount of sense because it turns out that if I create two instances of minus five, then this returns true. <laughs> so <coughs> this is all quite contingent. Does that still make sense, David? Uh, it makes a bit less sense. Yeah, exactly. And Miguel, Miguel has, has, has put it very nicely. It's just internal details of how Python works, which I have brought out by using this is comparison instead of equality. Fine. I want to point out that when I ran the property-based tests here, this could have returned two crazy large numbers, like 2 to the power of 128, but it didn't. It persistently returns a minimal example. Property-based tests aren't just about picking random numbers and feeding them in, or random inputs. Property-based tests also have what's called a shrinker. Once a system finds a counterexample, it tries to shrink it to provide a minimal counterexample for easier debugging. That's why we get this minus six. I'll say this again in a different way because it's, it's, it really matters. Um, Property-based testing can produce, it leverages the computational power to generate lots of unit tests but it also leverages that power to find minimal counterexamples using the shrinker. Please type yes in the chat if that makes sense, and no if it doesn't. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, there's something else that property-based tests do. I, I am an evangelist for these things. I'll just, I'll just be honest here. I think property-based testing is fabulous. Uh, you need some unit tests for the corner cases. Uh, put it another way. <laughs> property-based tests are not an excuse. They're no excuse to not think. You should still 
create unit tests for corner cases that you know might cause difficulty. But I think this line here is so important, and I've tried to um, illustrate why, even for very simple things. Um, this looks so easy, but it's still doing, it's doing real work for us. It's doing something else as well. If we look at the unit tests, it's implicit that my numerical identity should return true if the two inputs are equal, numerically equal, and false if they're not. Whereas here, this property is explicit, right? Property-based tests put properties, correctness properties, front and center, right? It's the properties we care about, not the particular unit instances. And I think psychologically, um, that, that makes a big difference as well. Um, please say yes if that makes sense. And no, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gyoza. Any, any comments before I move on? Okay. Um, I, I love tests, and in particular, I love property-based tests. I love, I love generating random integers. I love, I love the shrinker shrinking to find minimal counterexamples, and I love that my essentially what this style of programming does is rather than unit tests, it forces you to write your implementation and then compare it intelligently against a logically specified reference implementation, which is what I've done here. Okay, so. This is what I wrote up here. Unit test tests examples and properties are implicit. Property based tests assert properties directly and then leverage the power of the computer to run as many tests as basically you have computational power and patience for. Um, there's a whole world to this. And I'll just mention that there's, there's a sort of subfield of auto generating property based tests just by looking at the types of the code. So, um, this, this, can be, this can be iterated. You can have auto-generation, if you like, property-based generation of property-based tests. It's really cool. Um, I just don't see what's not to like in this. Um, I've talked about Shrinker. Okay, so when I started coding in Cairo, the first thing I did was to build a test suite that would allow me to test my code with property-based tests. You can clone it here. And for the rest of this talk, um, I'm not planning to take up the full hour. I think 40 minutes is more than enough here. So for the rest of this talk, um, I just want to run some tests. I want to show you the test suite running on the code that I am building at the moment. So this is live code, and some of it doesn't work. Um, so let's, let's do it. Just give me a yes in the chat if I may proceed and uh, know if, if you want me to stop for something. Okay. I'd almost feel reassured if someone could ask a question at some point because um, it reassures me. I like, I like being asked questions, but I will continue. Thank you very much. So first of all, let's just run the test suite. So I'll drop out of Python. <coughs> so PyTest will run, now there's some nice flags and this is this is a test file which i will show you in a minute but let's just run the tests so this is the test suite in action there we are and we see tests being run each of these past is i think roughly 300 tests 100 of them are unit tests and 200 of are, are property based. Something quite zen about this. I'm going to let it run to completion just so you can see that it does actually work. It's psychology. Please work. Who, who was it said the, that it's a demo stuff. I think it's just thinking very hard. 
Okay, say yes if I can control C out of this, and no if if you want me to wait. Can I have one more yes? Give me another yes, somebody. Thank you. Okay. No! Oh, goodness sake. Uh, pardon me. I'm just going to kill my test. Cool. Okay. So it, it does work. I promise. <laughs> Let's look at this thing. Um, I don't care about this stuff. Here. So this is how uh, I, I'm, I'm going to pick up the pace now. I don't know how much sense this will make. Just stop me if, if you if you need me, if you have a question. So these are some concrete numbers which I, I use to generate my unit test. So this is some numerical value. Uh, and you'll basically, I've chosen some small values, some boundary conditions, and that's it. And then I create some pairs and some triples and this is this is all basic data for running unit tests and now we have the property based um the generators i'll call them i think hypothesis calls them strategies i'll call it a generator so this is an arbitrary boolean right it's an integer between zero and one inclusive. Um, this is an arbitrary felt. I need arbitrary felts because one of my one of my tests. Oh, I'll just mention this now. As you may know, it's as important to check failing tests as it is to check successful tests. So one of the tests I do is to run a function on a integer that may not be in range and check that the um, function breaks as expected. Uh, please say yes if you're familiar with this or no if you're not. Don't be shy. Yeah, okay. I'm seeing yeses and no nos. Fine. Um, now this is quite an interesting one. Let's just look at this. I'm trying to create a pair of big unsigned integers, but I, as a programmer, know that a boundary condition is when the two elements are equal. So I want to focus some attention in my generator. If I just ask for an arbitrary big unsigned integer, which is just a, sorry, an arbitrary pair, which is just a pair of big integers, then I might not get enough um, pairs of identical large numbers. So the, there's a point here that writing generators is itself part of designing the tests. Please say yes if that makes sense and no if I've been unclear. Don't be shy. Cool. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and here we are, here we have it. Um, so this decorator will run my unit tests. Well, this is the test, right? Um, what does it say? If we take a big uint, turn it into an integer, and then turn the integer into back into a big uint, we get the big uint back again, fine. And we're testing this on some big uint, which is that initial list I showed you, which I handcrafted, and then an arbitrary big unit. And that test was in here somewhere. But what I think I'll do now is I'll jump back into Python. There we are. And um, I will run these tests by hand. So you saw the automated version, but let's let's actually run this test by hand. Test. So here are all the tests I wrote, and we want utility left, right, left. So I'm just going to run that test. There we are, and it works fine. But now I'm going to do something else. 
This is a little function which will allow us to inspect the inputs and outputs. So diagnose test is a wrapper around this test function that will run it and pull the inputs and outputs and show us what actually got run. Please type yes if you want to see this. Uh, Alec, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, please type yes if you want to see this and no if you don't. A few more reactions, please. Perfect. Thank you for the encouragement. So off we go. And why didn't that work? I did not expect that. Let me try another one. Interesting. OK, well, I will debug why the other thing did not produce data after, not now. Let's try test ID. So let's just go in and look at test ID. Okay, I have no explanation there, but we'll... Oh, I see why. Okay, fine. Doesn't matter. Um, let's test test ID. Now, I should show you the code. ID is one of my favorite functions. It inputs an unsigned integer and just returns it. Okay, so this function here should literally just check that the, here, here we, we have the success function. This is what we expect. We expect test ID to always succeed and return its input. And if the function fails, then we assert false and raise a flag. Um, so I'll just run test ID. That appears to work. And let's diagnose the test. And there we have it. We have all of our inputs. So maybe we can just look at this line here. We have success. We inputted, we input this big uint and we got this big uint out. So everything's hunky-dory. Um, please say yes if that makes sense and no if it doesn't. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I'll just run one more test and then I'll stop. I want to show you something with failure. So this is the numerical check. It checks that a big uint is well formed. So here I actually haven't even bothered with unit tests. I've just ran, I've appealed to a, a generator that generates a big uint which might have various malformness. It might be malformed in various ways. So we expect numcheck to succeed if the input is a big uint and to fail it precisely when it's not, right? This is, this is really important here. Um, the success actually is less interesting than checking the failure. This is a, well, I can feel you've got the point, so I'll just run it. Num check seems to work, and let's diagnose the test. That's 200. So we have some successes, and here we have a failure, and I reckon it's this. This, this thing here is not in range. That's why we've had a failure there. OK, cool. So this is, in summary, um, this big uint library has two parts. It has the Cairo code, which does stuff in Cairo, and then it has an equally important test suite, which tests that code using property-based tests against a re essentially a reference implementation, which is encoded in the success and failure functions. Um, that concludes my main points. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, I hand control back to Yoni and Swag Timers Prime. Uh, I, I have a quick question. Please. Time. Um, yeah, so from my high level understanding, I think you're uh, given a property, you're randomly drawing samples that meet that property. 
um, as a you know, uniformly random. So g given this assumption, I think um, we need to sort of recursively going into the properties um, and divide them into sub properties until every property can be sampled random, r uniformly random, randomly, um, without us, you know, being afraid of edge cases not being covered. Um, sorry, sorry for my very complex question, uh, but I think it's just just based on your sampling uniformly, uh, randomly from from a property. Um, we need to do the work of thinking about edge cases or you know, skew this skewed distributions among the property, and we need to divide it down uh, in, into sm into smaller and smaller um, um, properties. Um, thank you very much for the question. I think there's you are you are unpacking several issues there. Um, let me let me try to say back to you what you just said to me. Um, one thing is. Um, it's helpful to test the smallest bits of the program that we can. So we try to break the program down into testable, small testable parts, which is good programming practice anyway. Please, Mr. Gales, leave your mic un unmuted so we can, we can converse. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I will say psychologically, if if you know you're going to have to write tests for a function, it, it at least for me, it really encourages me to split my function up into um, sub functions and helper functions because I know that I'll be able to write tests for them. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and that, that doesn't directly have to do with the properties. It's just, I think, good programming practice to write small bits that you can exhaustively test, that are easy to test. I think that's that's good. Um, you also pointed that there is a question of sampling, right? So I can easily write a sampler for an 8-bit integer. I'm not sure that, um, sorry, let me rephrase this as Mr. Gilson. Um, if you if you ask me to write a sampler for an 8-bit integer, I can say, sure, no problem. But Mr. Gilza, if you ask me to write a sampler for a 625-bit integer, I might need a bit more information. Would that make sense? Yeah, sure. So um, you, you, one side effect of thinking in this way is it makes you think, rigorously, not just about the properties you want to test, but about the distribution of the sample. And we saw, I put an example in with pairs. I know that I'm testing an identity function, so I know that I want to have some pairs in there where pairs A and B where A is equal to B. So I wrote a rather crude but effective bespoke generator that will generate pairs A, B, where roughly one third of the time A will be equal to B, and roughly one third of the time it won't. Does that also address a point you raised, Mr. Gilson? Yeah. Um, and then the final thing, which I've said before, but I'll just reiterate, um, the style here is you write your programs twice, once in code and once in logic, once in properties. Um, and the properties are they're not just testing the code, they're also documenting it. Uh, I think more clearly that unit tests can. Unit tests are examples, property-based tests are rules, which get compiled by the computer into examples using generators which you may have to design yourself. Although to be clear, there are generators available, but for large data sets, you might want to tweak the distribution to focus on when you think the edge cases will be. Mr. Gilza, does that, does that address yeah. all the points you raised? Yeah. This is very thorough. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. More questions, please? Okay. So the... Um, just, just to let you know, I, I, I must confess that this diagnose test thing 
it, I have not yet released. Um, so in the version that you clone, you don't have diagnose tests, but there are other things which are demoed, which let you get the same effect. Basically, I, I did version one and then realized I was typing the same thing again and again into the command line. So I, I wrote a little wrapper for it. Um, but that will come out in, in the next version. This is all under active, very active development. I'm working as hard as I can to get this all up to scratch. Um, but I think the principles hopefully will be clear. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Yami, do you want to do you want to take over? Uh, maybe Swat can uh, summarize? Sure. Mr. Prime? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I think it was very captivating, uh, even for I'm not a dev, but it was uh, really awesome. Um, I loved the interactive parts where you involved the, the listeners. Um, that reminded me of, of some of the few good teachers I've had uh, in my life. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, if anybody has, has uh, questions, then now is your last chance. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. And uh, if nobody has questions, then I will conclude this uh, workshop. Obviously, you're welcome to be in touch um, by email or whatever outside the chat. I'm, I'm at your disposal. And I want to mention that, uh, that I've recorded this, so you can freely share it um, afterwards. Okay. Uh, I, I have one question, if I may. Um, so Please. I see you're using like this abstract Cairo function class. So do you actually run uh, your functions on the all the computation in a Cairo interpreter in Cairo VM, or is it all Python? Or how does that work? Oh, uh, good question. So yes, it, it runs in the Cairo VM. Let's let's look at the code. Um, I didn't mean to do that, but fine. Um, so. The magic happens in the Cairo Smart Test Framework, which is basically, it's a great big wrapper, blah de blah de blah and it all boils down to invoke function by name here, which creates a runner and then invokes it. So ultimately, this line, line 84, um, is the fulcrum the fulcrum of the test framework where where stuff actually gets passed to Cairo and and executed. And to be fair, we may then have to read the results of the function calls out of memory. Um, and there are facilities for doing that as well. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, and this is pretty amazing. <laughs> So, like, right, well, a big pain point currently is that the test suits uh, take a long time in Cairo. And I think well, what would take a long time? A oh, test suite. Uh, test, test suites, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you were running uh, yours uh, and you had like thousands of examples, uh, right, uh, together, uh, it, it took a couple of seconds. So, um, this is pretty cool. That's encouraging. Thank you. Um, when I, when I, in my first designs for this, I compiled the Cairo code each time, idiotically, and then I, I realized I didn't need to. I could just create a runner and invoke it. So that may explain some of the speed up, Milan. The machine I'm working on is not particularly powerful, so it's it's not raw compute that's doing that. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Thanks. That's interesting. Milan, thank you. Okay. Any final questions? Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, thank, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for, for uh, this presentation. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, like I said, I've recorded this so we can share it. It's going to be on our Discord and I'll also share it on Twitter. And um, we'll definitely have more workshops in the future as well. So um, keep your eyes on that and we'd be happy to uh, see you again. So thank you and bye-bye. Goodbye everybody, be well, stay safe.